Can I start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, friends. It's Friday afternoon, and we are back with the FFF webinar that is the forefront of future frontiers. Uh, we have finished uh, series seven last week, and from this week, we are exploring series eight. The theme for series eight is emerging and re-emerging infections, and we have with us a very interesting speaker. On this episode 36 of series A, we have with us Dr. Ranganathan Iyer, who is a unique uh, distinction of being a clinical microbiologist with a training in pathology also. So, before we move on to this session, I would invite our dean, Dr. P. F. Kotur, to welcome the speaker. Over to you, Dr. Kotur. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Ranganathan Iyer, and uh, good afternoon, my colleagues, uh, Professor Bhat, Dr. Mahalakshmi, and uh, Other staff members, students, and the participants, participants from various other institutes. I am indeed privileged to complete this ritual, rather, uh, on behalf of our management and the university, to welcome this distinguished speaker for today on this platform of Triple F for Front of Future Frontiers, which, uh, for the information of the uh, people who have. Uh, Uh, logged in for the first time and for the information of our speaker today, this platform is almost seven eight months old and earned quite a lot of credibility and various great scientists, teachers, and uh, academicians, researchers, scientists have shared this platform and shared their expertise and knowledge with our participants. This is how we have earned the credibility. AVMC has gone into the, the Indian map as regards this. Concerned, it is a very timely start of this during the time of the COVID, when the whole of the the medical facility, including the all the the country as a whole, was taken aback. Uh, suddenly, you know, in the month of March, knowing not what to do, this the AVMC stuck with this novel idea. Our scientific society must be given the credit. We started this, and we started uh, inviting great eminent luminaries from across the four continents on this. Platform and now, of course, our now the database has got seen nearing 7,000, I think. So this is about the uh, Triple F webinar, and you uh, know, this uh, topic of uh, emerging and re-emerging trends in uh, infections is quite appropriate at this point of time. Of course, COVID has not totally disappeared from uh, around around us. You know, in fact, we all of us have started the vaccination for that in the last one week or here. And we have a uh, first-hand experience of many getting many of our infection, many of our colleagues getting uh, infected, many of our health personnel, professionals, friends getting uh, infected uh, with this uh, great infection. You know, this uh, hospital emerging HAIs, they also hospital-acquired infections are the ones which were originated in the hospital, might be viral, bacterial, or even a format for factor for the also. Also, so then uh, we always know that the prevention is better than cure, and we all are aware that these hospital-acquired infections contribute quite a lot for the uh, burden of the burden, or you can say they are categorized under a special category of preventable deaths. You know, if you take proper adaptive measures, then certainly you can uh, prevent the complication and thereby avoid the the morbidity and also the associated uh, morbidity mortality associated with that. These infection. That's why it is categorized, classified as a preventable cause of the deaths following the admissions in the hospital. And of course, all hospitals, including ours, we have got a hospital infection control committee which meets periodically, and we have certain SOPs in place. And uh, certainly, this uh, even from the point of view of uh, our our hospital at large, and even the other hospitals at large, where uh, the The eminent person who has been uh, heading a uh, prestigious position or I mean, uh, prestigious hospital in the city of Hyderabad, you know, he is sharing his experience, Dr. Ranganathan Iyer, and it will help a long way in all of us to have uh, to update our uh, knowledge in this uh, wonderful area. And I bring greetings from our Honorable Chancellor, Honorable Madam Chancellor, and Board of Management, Mr. Suresh, Samuel, our Vice Chancellor, and everybody. And on behalf of the all the AVMC, I will welcome you, Dr. Ranganathan Iyer, for this talk. 
Uh, over to you, Dr. Mahalakshmi. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Actually, uh, before we move further, I take pleasure in uh, introducing uh, formally Dr. Ranganathan Ayer. And I know Dr. Ranganathan Ayer from year 2009, when we first organized uh, uh, infection control conference from Atma Gandhi Medical College. From that time, I think we have troubled him quite enough, two or three times, uh, including the WHO sponsored conference, which we did in 2010. And sir has been always a very popular speaker. And more than that, he has always uh, accepted our invitations and uh, he has uh, uh, um, shared our, he has been very generous in sharing his experience and uh, uh, ideas with us. So that is what. And uh, in short, uh, there is the consultant clinical microbiologist in the Rainbow Hospitals uh, and Perinatal Care, Hyderabad. He did his uh, MBBS from Rural Medical College in Loni near Pune, University of Pune. And then he went to AFMC for his post graduation. And he is, I think, one of the unique medical microbiologists who is uh, trained in FRC path from Royal College of Pathologists, UK. And he is also a member of National Academy of Medical Sciences. Uh, his CV reads uh, like uh, very impressive. He was uh, spent three years in AFMC Pune, then said GS Medical College for two years. Then he moved over to Breach Candy for uh, as a senior clinical microbiologist. He was there for seven years. And then he is uh, into the Global Hospital Group Hyderabad for the last 20 years. Sir has been instrumental in uh, many of the changes which have been brought out about the awareness about hospital acquired infections, uh, awareness about creating strategies for combating this uh, multi drug resistance organisms. His scientific contributions are quite impressive. He's got more than 32 publications and uh, 49, I think, conference papers. He has contributed a book on how to collect uh, clinical specimens for microbiology and all. And apart from books and chapters in books, he is a faculty and invited guest lecturer in many of the medical microbiology forums, including uh, the conferences held in Jipmer and other places. He himself has organized 11 CMAs workshops and he has won the best paper in mycology term neonatal bloodstream candidiasis. That was in the Indian in Association of Medical Microbiologists in 2006. So more than that, he has been involved continuously in that uh, continuing professional development scheme of the Royal College of Pathologists of UK uh, from, since the year 2018. And he is the country level leader and coordinator for the uh, program of uh, international uh, uh, training, that is from 2015. He's also an empaneled assessor for NABH and NABL and has contributed significantly. And more than that, his ideas on infection control and uh, also in uh, antimicrobial resistance, what needs to be done. He's a very vocal speaker and he keeps uh, telling uh, in all the forums what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And the work in his parent institution in the Gober Hospital stands testimony to all his efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Ranganathan Ayer. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much for that rather generous introduction to this audience. And yes, it's really been a pleasure knowing and being a part of various um, meetings both in-house as well as zonal conferences and the WHO sponsored conference that happened when Dr. Mahalakshmi was at the MGM, the Mahatma Gandhi Mission Hospital in Pondicherry. And uh, yes, it's been, it's, uh, I, I think the first time we came across uh, uh, each other was in the year 2009. And I think after that, there's been a regular interaction uh, almost uh, at least once in two years. For, for some kind of a meeting on infections and infection control um, with Dr. Mahalakshmi as the lead person in organizing a particular meet at the MGM hospital. It's very nice. It's been a very, very nice uh, uh, and a pleasant experience knowing her. And uh, as a very good professional colleague, as an academic professional colleague, and it gives me great pleasure participating in this particular webinar. Well, in this time of the COVID pandemic, obviously almost every uh, single meeting has to be um, 
has to be online for the good of everybody so that uh, you know more and more of us don't go down with the uh, infection and this is one of the series where we could talk we could still participate we could still share our experiences and yet uh, be very safe at the places of work away from from uh, infecting each other and probably that's that's how the uh, immediate future in 2021 is also going to be i'll start with my first uh, slide of the presentation can i have the presentation on all right okay well friends sorry sorry friend next i'll move over yeah fine fine so friends this is a short overview on what have been the recent trends and challenges in the sphere of infection control starting from around 2019 largely centered around what's actually happened in the year 2020 as far as infection control is concerned now it's it's actually a huge um, uh, sphere of work that needs to be uh, all encompassed and presented in about 35 to 40 minutes and uh, needless to say infection control and prevention is everyone's responsibility that's the first thing and that is generally ill understood it is usually the it is considered the responsibility of one person who is designated as the chairperson of the infection control committee it is considered as the sole responsibility of the infection control officer and that person is held responsible for what is done what is overdone what is not done what is underdone unfortunately not many people know that it is their responsibility as well when they point one finger three fingers point back to you so so that really needs to be understood when we talk about you know miss endeavors and miss adventures in infection control and prevention it's a thankless job and it needs to be done very well and fortunately it's an absolute necessity in a healthcare institution we can't get away uh with without doing a proper infection control program in any hospital in modern medicine today and of course it it helps to integrate almost all specialties this is one particular subject uh infection control and prevention that brings back that brings together all specialties uh of medicine with prevention of infections and good patient care next slide please all right these are some of the areas of the of concern for infection control next and i'll begin the first i mean the first area of carbapenem resistant gram negatives now this is something that haunts all all hospitals that i know of the world over i mean gone are the days when the western europe and the americas could say that they don't deal with any multi drug resistance they also have as much multi drug resistant bugs whether they call it imported or exported ones but then still they also grapple with the same kind of infections as we do but then why are we interested in detection of cpe carbapenem resistant enterobacterials or enterobacteria ca this includes primarily carbapenem resistant klebsiella pneumoniae carbapenem resistant e coli and some of the other members of the enterobacteria ca such as enterobacter citrobacter hafnia serratia and so on that is precisely because the choice of what antibiotics you could use to treat patients with invasive infections is very limited there is a very narrow preserved susceptibility to colistin which is also come into question now with colistin resistance coming up in a very big way in gram negatives these patients unless they are properly treated and adequately managed in intensive care units carry a very high mortality and morbidity rate unfortunately there is a horizontal transfer of these genes that elab that help to elaborate the enzymes called carbapenemases which are uh, which is uh, which is uh, again mediated by mobile genetic elements 
So what happens is one E. coli can transfer these genes to another E. coli. It can also transfer it to a Klebsiella from an E. coli. You can have carbapenemase genes transferred from an E. coli to an Enterobacter, sometimes even to some unrelated organisms and so on. So this is what is called as a horizontal transfer. This is a huge problem in infection control. That's because you try and treat one type of carbapenem resistant, say, say a bloodstream infection today, and you send the patient home. And again, after a month or so, if the patient is a diabetic and, and suffers another urosepsis episode, they could just come back with another bloodstream infection caused by an unrelated organism, which is carbapenem resistant. In addition to this, there are resistance elements that confer resistance to groups of antibiotics. Um, it is not just one single beta-lactam or one single quinolone that a particular organism would prove resistant to. They become resistant to quinolones, to aminoglycosides, to beta-lactams, to, to maybe um, the, the beta-lactam lactamase inhibitors and so on. So it's, it's something like groups of antibiotics which prove uh, ineffective to treat these multi drug resistant infections. They can easily spread through the, uh, the through the hands of healthcare workers, through the hands of not just the healthcare healthcare workers. Now, this is another misnomer. You get these organisms only when you go to a hospital. No, it is not. You can get them in the hospital in the community. You can get them in the hospital. It so 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 it's basically hand carriage contaminated food, contaminated water. Because where are we trying and draining out all our sewage? into the rivers, into the ponds, into the lakes. And those lakes supply drinking water to us. So mind you, whatever you discharge today is going to come back to you tomorrow in the form of contaminated water. And that is what helps colonizing the entire gut, that the whole of our gastrointestinal tract gets colonized with these organisms and the normal flora get poorly replaced. Community acquired colonization therefore has been documented. And in the Rainbow Children's Hospital, in one particular year, we had about 1,478. That is, the, this was just about three months data. And uh, I mean, what we do is we go and stick a meropenum disc on all our stool cultures, whether it comes from uh, the, the community or whether it comes from the hospital ones. And we found 74 out of 1,478 which comes to approximately 5% of our stool cultures showing carbapenem resistant E. coli Klebsiella. It may not be a pathogen, but then it still proves that the gut of that particular child is already colonized with a carbapenem resistant organism. And out of these 61 patients, just look at this, 61 patients out of a 74 were outpatients. They were not even admitted to the hospital. They just come brought in by their mothers or fathers or both for an unrelated problem, say a diarrhea or a urinary tract infection and a secondary to a gastroenteritis and so on. And that gastroenteritis led the clinician to do a stool culture. And when we did a stool culture, we found it to be carbapenem resistant, Klebsiella or an E. coli colonized. So this colonization was found in almost 61 of 74 outpatients in a span of about three to four months. This is our data for approximately, it's about four to five percent colonization rate, which is really, really high. So just think about it. Your gut is already colonized in a small child with a carbapenem resistant organism. And if this child has to be operated tomorrow, say for an appendicectomy or for any other problem, if a procedure has to be done on this particular patient and they're put onto the table, you're already beginning to treat a carbapenem resistant organism. They don't have to get admitted to the hospital to pick up the bug. They are already coming in with the bug inside their gut. And this is the scale. This is the magnitude of the problem. The next slide, please. Right. So therefore, we, we come to this understanding that MDR GNB is not just in the hospitals. It's there in the community as well. It's more common, at least it appears to be more common in our part of the world, or at least that's what Western Europe and the Americas lead us to believe, that you people are the problems, you people are the sources of these infectious uh, organisms. Wastewater systems and effluents from hospitals generally contribute to this. In addition to this, we also have sewage from various treatment plants and from homes and all that. 
uh, emptied into our uh, river water, into our lake water and so on. Along with that, we also try and fortify to get huge and bigger size produced in agriculture with antibiotics. And the same antibiotics are also fed to sheep, to chicken, to poultry and to pigs and so on, so that you get better meat, you get more. Uh, I mean, you fatten up all these, uh, all these animals with uh, antibiotics and then you take the meat under the mistaken understanding that we are going to get better quality meat. But then unfortunately, what we are actually consuming is antibiotic along with the meat and that helps to bring in more antibiotic resistant organisms into the gut. So all this actually leads to a huge reservoir of gram negatives, particularly the enterobacterials, with almost 10 to 12 percent of our fecal microbiology cultures showing a colonization. This is a, on an average, I'm telling you, when we look at our uh, fecal microbiology cultures, particularly the pediatric age group over a period of one year. Next slide, please. All right, now this is just to show you, now this is a slightly busy slide, but then if you concentrate, there are three types of gram negatives that we have. They have the, there are enterobacteriaceae, which is an E. coli, Klebsiella, the enterobacter, the citrobacter, and so on here. Then you have a cyanitobacter baumeni, which is a huge, hardy, multidrug resistant pathogen, which we have here. And then we have Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is yet another non-fermenting gram negative, which comes mostly from moist areas. Now, if we look at the epidemiology of all these three organisms, hand carriage is usual. Quinolones and carbapenems administered to patients are a major risk factors with the cyanitobacter. Hand carriage is a little lesser than moist contaminated areas in Pseudomonas. But definitely one needs to screen and isolate patients, at least in, in those uh, areas which are non-endemic for multidrug resistant gram negatives. Patient and staff education is something which is constantly required for all the three organisms. So there are certain features which are common to all the three and there are some differentiating features when we talk about are we dealing with a multidrug resistant enterobacterial? Are we dealing with a multidrug resistant cyanitobacter or are we dealing with a multidrug resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa? Next slide, please. Next. Yeah, so these are some of the interventions for infection control that one could talk about. Hand hygiene, surveillance, environmental cleaning, decolonization of carriers, isolation and segregation. What do we do with our respiratory equipment? How, uh, I mean, are we going to have sensor taps and are we going to put uh, tap filters and so on? Or are we going to resort to a fecal microbiota transplant and put an exactly totally different uh, normal flora, which we actually started off with when we were babies and then grew up to be infants and kids. And then now we are adults and unfortunately all the flora is gone and now we are all colonized with multidrug resistant Klebsiellus. But then remember, one very important thing to remember in this is a single thing in any of these, if we take any, sing, any one single measure and try and measure the efficacy of each of these alone, when done alone, the efficacy does not stand out as very good, except for maybe hand hygiene. That is the only infection control measure or intervention which could prove very, very efficacious in controlling a multidrug resistant gram negative colonization or an infection. Otherwise, if you look at environmental cleaning and control, if you just, just because you wash the environment clean after every patient and, and thrice a day alone and don't bother about hand hygiene, don't bother about doing um, uh, about isolation and segregation of infected or colonized patients, don't bother about your cleaning of respiratory equipment and so on is your infection control problem going to come down? No, it will not come down. The same thing holds good for the others, such as surveillance, such as isolation and segregation. Sometimes isolation and segregation may not be uh, practical in our situation, where India is supposed to be endemic for multidrug resistant gram-negative colonizers and infectious pathogens. It may not be possible. So, so if you have 90% of your patients, your inpatients in the hospital, all of them colonized with a multidrug resistant gram negative, how are you going to go about isolating? Will you isolate all of them? Is it practically possible to isolate 90% of our patients? No, it is not possible. 
So in such a case, segregating and isolating only those high risk groups, say, for instance, if you have a patient like a transplant recipient and that person is infected with an NDR gram negative, probably you could isolate. Or if you have two patients, one is a transplant recipient and the other is not. And the one which is not a transplant recipient is is infected, say, which, uh, I mean, with a carbapenem resistant Klebsiella. Probably it makes sense to isolate that person away from the transplant recipient because you have an immunocompromised patient sitting next to the person who is infected or colonized with this MDR GNB. But otherwise, all these interventions for infection control must be done together along with a proper education program and infection control if one wishes to achieve anything in, in controlling multidrug resistant gram negative infections. Next slide, please. Right. After this, I'll move on to, so, so multidrug resistant gram negative is one of the uh, challenges that 2020 has been dealing with in the, in, the, in the arena of infection control. Now to move on, we talk about operating rooms. Now there has been a lot of talk on infection control and the role of infection control practitioners in, in trying to advise which kind of surgical procedures should be done in which type of operating rooms. So convention, so I mean, if you look at the types of operating rooms, basically, we have a conventionally ventilated operating suit. This is something where you could do your laparoscopic cholecystectomies, you could do your hernias and hydroceles, you could do your mesh repairs and so on. Then you have ultra clean ventilated or UCV operating suits. Now these are uh, supposed to have laminar flow and those are the ones which are used for cardiothoracic surgery particularly the orthopedic um, uh, procedures such as total hip and total knee and maybe some of the cold orthopedic uh, surgeries including tumors. Then you also have uh, it being used for transplants and sometimes for ophthalmology. The unventilated and the treatment rooms are almost the same. They are almost akin to the side rooms that we can see in some of our um, uh, old time-honored uh, government general hospitals. Say probably if you go to Madras Medical College and the government general hospital, you would see some side rooms over there where you would incise and drain an abscess, where you would try and look at dressing an infected wound. And, they, uh, and this is what you see in all these places like the Grand Medical College and JJ Group of Hospitals in Bombay and so on. Next slide, please. So what are the issues of recent interest that has, per uh, I mean, that has appeared in various publications in 2019 and 2020 are, what are the airflow patterns in operating rooms? When do we use a concept called as forced air warming in operating theaters? What do we do about people moving in and out with whatever they think is a very good surgical attire? How do we control traffic of personnel in and out of operating rooms? And of course, what has also um, got to do with biofouling of surgical power tools during routine use? So if you try and look at a couple of these at least for uh, the sake of brevity, it would really be of great interest to see how uh, things have appeared in the recent past. Next slide, please. So there have been multiple publications on this particular uh, issue. Say, for instance, if you look at construction and the role of infection prevention practitioners in advising on how and what all parameters do you need to check in an operating uh, suit before you declare it fit. Now, one of the commonest things that happens is surgeons try and put in their inputs. The administrators do whatever harm they can do. I'm sorry if I'm trying to hit upon any administrator in the group at uh, Arvada Medical College. I don't mean offense, but then what happens is an infection control person is never, ever, ever taken into account. They do not form, they do not form a part of the committee, which, which decides while, while the building is coming up, while the operating suits are being built, that's the time when, when we need to be involved. So in case AVMC is coming up with another hospital, please bear this in mind and, and do involve your infection control team to advise you on, on what all needs to be done for an operating suit. So there is a lot to be done, actually. It's not just air distribution systems. And the worst thing is, after doing all these things the way people want to do it, 
they just call upon microbiology department and say i mean please come and take your swabs and tell us whether everything is okay or not obviously we're going to grow uh, aerobic spore bearers we grow mrsas we grow everything and then people clean and clean and clean at some point or the other operations have to begin so therefore we say okay fine now go ahead and start your surgeries but then it doesn't mean that everything is hunky dory or everything is perfectly okay before we actually come to microbiological surveillance theater interiors for obvious defects have to be checked the air distribution within and between rooms of the theater need to be checked what is your air use air handling unit how have you meant, how have you done it now if you if you really take a walk across some of the smaller hospitals even in pondicherry you would find that the air handling unit of the so called operation theater is common with the air handling unit of the rest of the hospital so if that is so then the air gets circulated all through the hospital so you, what you're going to get into the ot is contaminated air from the rest of the hospital as well as contaminated air from outside so then at least you need to have filters but then even those hepa filters are not fitting properly setback ventilation and indications for the same what are the air change rates in the theater it's extremely important to dwell on each of these points so so so, so well, i mean if you take a look at all of these it just gives you one idea engineering controls is so very important when you construct an operation theater and that engineer the biomedical engineer and the hospital engineering department has to work in close liaison with the infection control officer and that is when you get a reasonably good operation theater done and if you see the last but not the least is airborne microbiological surveillance it is not first on the list before we say yes this operation theater is perfectly okay you can start operating from day after tomorrow next slide please next slide yeah so now ultra clean ventilated theater now what actually happens how is it different from a conventionally ventilated theater so they found that there is a laminar flow of air it's like a curtain that comes down from the top and it just moves like this like a curtain how you would put two curtains moving in opposite directions it just moves that way it's a unidirectional flow onto the surgical zone so if if you have an operation theater table on uh, at this level and then the, the air just comes down like this and it moves away from the patient so it's actually a zone of clean air a column of clean air sterile air that comes onto the uh, operating field now this air gets recirculated in uh, considerable volumes and definitely we need filtration of this air because the air is actually drawn from outside so it needs to be filtered with hepa filters and the efficiency of these hepa filters how do you know whether they are working or not so therefore there has to be a check at least once in 6 months either you repair the hepa filters or you change the hepa filters either of these two but something needs to be done the first thing is to install the hepa filters the second thing is to take care of them unfortunately everybody talks about an ultra clean we have laminar flow we have everything this thing that thing and when was it built 12 years ago and then what uh, how are you maintaining it oh yeah at that time somebody had looked at it but then we have never had a problem how would you not have a problem if you don't change hepa filters for 12 years it's not possible next slide please so there's a lot of talk in the journal of hospital infection which came up saying that this is a paradoxical thing they found that despite having laminar flow theaters this is the time when they woke up to the fact that just because you have a laminar flow just because you put some hepa filters doesn't mean that your surgical site wound infection rates will come down they they looked at the surgical site wound infection rates in orthopedic surgery despite the best of facilities and they found that the number of revision procedures the number of revision arthroplasties of the hip and the knee increased despite putting all the wonderful gadgets which which everybody thought is going to save them from from uh, yama and still it did not save them from yama the revision procedures actually increased and then they found out there are other factors not just installing hepa filters and uh, trying to look at them say maybe once in 2 years or 3 years there is a total lack of theater discipline too many people coming in and out of the theater and the ors no face masks over the nose and the mouth or they just over there for name sake and very poor infection control practices including hand washing and scrubbing by the team all of this actually contributes 
to the surgical site wound infections, to the increased number of revision arthroplasties in orthopedic procedures, despite having all these wonderful gadgets uh, fitted in to, to, to what is called as an ultra clean ventilated theater. Next slide, please. This came up in the Journal of Hospital Infections sometime in 2019. Now, a common thing. Now we come down to microbiological surveillance. This is actually the last on the list, but then this is what we are normally called for. Come and take your swabs. Now, where do we take the swabs? This is a very common question which every infection control nurse who is appointed in the hospital comes up. Sir, they are asking us to take infection uh, uh, swabs from OT. Now, uh, where, where do we take it? And if you and if you leave it to the OT personnel to take it and send it to you, there'll be floor swabs, there'll be ceiling swabs, there'll be wall swabs, there'll be all sorts of swabs from swabs from everywhere except the areas where they ought to have taken the swabs. These are the areas that come into close contact with the patient's skin and the mucosal surfaces. So therefore, the overhead lights, the head and the foot end of the table. The bottles apparatus for delivery of anesthesia gases, the interior of it, I mean. The suction apparatus, the, tu the, the inside of the tubing. You also need, uh, I mean, what we actually need is from these, the laryngoscope blade and the handle separately. The face mask, which delivers the, the gases on and the oxygen on and moistens it. These are the places where actually you, you need to take swabs. Instead of that, swabs are taken from the floor, the walls, and the ceiling of the OR. So we do grow staff, we do grow uh, aerobic spore bearers, but then we just sort of disregard it and give out an NG report. So microbiology department then says, I, I mean, the, the general opinion is anyway, whatever we collect and send to you, you call, I mean, you're an NG department, you're a no-growth department. So, so we get nicknamed as a no-growth department. Actually, we are not a no-growth department. Because we don't grow anything out of our pockets. We grow what? We grow organisms from what material is supplied to us. So that's the problem. The, the problem is not about growing organisms. The problem is actually where are you taking your specimens from? That's very important. Next slide, please. Right. Now, coming to the next thing in operation theaters itself, forced air warming. Now, this particularly happens when you touch the colon. And this, and this came to light when we started doing a lot of colonic surgeries when Dr. Vergis Mathai started operating in, in Global. Hypothermia is one of the complications, it's, it's one of the problems that is associated with both orthopedic surgeries, with uh, colonic gastrointestinal surgeries, and sometimes with, with many other kind of uh, procedures as well, even transplants to some extent. There is a cooling of the body, so therefore there is a loss of body heat, which actually uh, increases the duration of the surgery. There is a risk of wound infection and pressure ulcers. There is an increased uh, requirement for transfusion or even ventilation that increases the length of the stay in the ICU and therefore in the hospital. It also increases the risk of dyscarythmias and sometimes MI. <coughs> and there is a relative hypoxia of tissues with vasoconstriction. So to prevent this hypothermia, we have something called as air warming units, which the aim of this is to prevent hypothermia and all the adverse effects. This actually came up to a lot of lights. The, I mean, a lot of studies came up in the year 2019 and 2020. And I'll just try and show you what actually has come up in the last couple of years. Next slide, please. Now, this is this is an air warming method. This is a unit for air warming, which is FAW, forced air warming. There are two other systems which I'm not going to even, even talk about because there's a lot of physics and engineering construction which is uh, which is uh, I mean which revolves around these units. This is a simple forced air warming, and this is how it gets delivered finally to the patient. Next, this is straight out of out of one of the review articles, but the, there are some infection concerns with the forced air warming. It's very important because what happens is you always keep the forced air warmer at the foot end of the patient. So it gives you one blast of air like this. And then there is a laminar flow of air that comes from the top. These two meet together. So uh, and and that creates an eddy current which actually disrupts the airflow in the theater. 
This is one thing. The excess heat from these devices also can contribute to eddy current formation and that can increase contamination in the surgical site. So this is one of the common problems that we have with a, a forced air warping. It's very important not to create this eddy current. So the place where you keep this particular air warmer is, is of paramount importance. And there have been a number of studies that have looked at this at different locations and how much of the air impinges onto the patient, uh, trying to reduce the hypothermia versus the ultra clean ventilated air that keeps circulating as a laminar flow in the operation theater. Next slide, please. I move on to after operation theaters and move on to the whole and soul, the most important antimicrobial stewardship. Everyone is so very fond of it's almost as if infection control is synonymous with antibiotic stewardship. And there are so many concepts which have been brought into antimicrobial stewardship. Unfortunately, what happens is people try and make it complex and complex and more complex and more more complex. Actually, infection control, like, like one Professor Shine method from South Africa said, it's one of the easiest things. Infection control is one of the simple, plain, logical, easy things in a hospital to do. But then I don't know why we try and complicate this just because we would like to draw more attention to ourselves as infection control practitioners. Antibiotic stewardship is, some, is a classic example which I can give where people have added to, to its complexity by leaps and bounds. But then if you look at this definition, which is straight out of a textbook again, it's from Glenn and Mayhall. A set of measures or interventions delivered by a multidisciplinary team working in healthcare institutions, the aim being to optimize antimicrobial use among patients, the aim again being to improve patient outcomes, ensure a cost-effective therapy, reduce adverse sequelae of antimicrobial use, such as antimicrobial resistance and Clostridium difficile infection. Now, if you look at this, each and every word is very important. It's a set of measures or interventions, which means it, it's not one single thing that you do today and it's going to uh, hold good for the rest of your life. It doesn't happen that way. It's a multidisciplinary team. So again, just like infection control, it's everybody's responsibility. It is not just pinpointed to one particular person. And if, not, and if something goes wrong, that person is to be checked out. No. Where do you do this? In a healthcare institution. Why is it done? To optimize antimicrobial use. The word optimize is very important. I don't mean restrict. Now, one of the commonest problems with, uh, I mean, which clinicians face is, oh, the AMS guys, the antimicrobial stewardship guys want to come and restrict. They, uh, I mean, the, they, the, the, the common mistaken notion is, you are trying to curtail my antibiotic prescriptions. The aim is not to curtail anybody. The aim is not to restrict anything. It is to optimize the use of antimicrobials so that it is used for the correct indications at the correct time, for the correct duration, at the correct dose, which improves patient outcomes and definitely ensures cost-effective therapy. Next slide, please. Right. So these are some of the goals of the program to increase the frequency of appropriate antibiotic prescribing practice, which uh, goes on to treatment of infections, minimizing your adverse events, and definitely reducing the, the amount of antimicrobial resistance and the incidence of Clostridium uh, difficile antibiotic associated diarrhea, which we see very commonly in our hospitals. Yes, so this, the, this is know when antibiotics work and, the, and try and get smart in healthcare with regards to this. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are the core elements of any antimicrobial stewardship program. There has to be a management committee, a commitment. So, sirs and madam, all of you are sitting right at the top, the dean, the chairman, the principal, the director, everybody has to have a commitment. Otherwise, it will never, this is something which doesn't start at the bottom and go up, it percolates down. So, it, it starts from the top and comes down. So, it's very, very important for the management to have a commitment. Administration comes into play a lot for a good AMS program. That helps to formulate guidelines, implementation. Well, I mean, without guidelines, you don't implement anything. Unless you implement, you don't monitor. 
and the whole thing has to be quality assured. So these are the core elements of any antibiotic stewardship program. Next slide, please. Right. Now this is something. Then now this is something that appeared in the Journal of Hospital Infection 2020. We had a COVID-19 pandemic, which is still going on. It's an it's a, it's an ongoing pandemic, but has antimicrobial resistance work, AMR work, has it suffered? The WHO came up in 2011 and and said that there is an emergency. AMR is an emergency. That's that's how it was declared with that arrow, which which went through a target. I'm sure everyone has seen that poster from the WHO. But then there well, probably AMR has suffered because of COVID-19. The reasons being there has been a disruption because of clinical service delivery during the pandemic. A lot of people stayed at home. A lot of people came only for a few hours. There was a lot of screening of people. A lot of people were not given care. A lot of people were given selective care. There was a bit of a slant towards caring for the COVID-19 patients and the complications thereof. There has also been a disruption in global antibiotic supply chains. That's because a lot of companies went into lockdown. Countries went into lockdown. There was a lack of transportation facilities. So therefore, antibiotics could not reach where they should have reached at the correct time. There was also a tendency to overtreat hospitalized COVID-19 patients with antibiotics. This was a viral infection and still we saw hordes and hordes of uh, dihydroxychloroquine, tetracyclines, azithromycin, ivermectin, all of that being put into, into use to treat COVID-19. So you're trying to use antifungals, antiparasitic antibiotics, along with antivirals to treat a viral infection. So obviously the remaining bugs like Streptococcus pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae and some of your uh, um, some of your your other organisms are going to pick up resistance to these antibiotics. So what were the interventions that would be necessary at least now? Restrict the number of antibiotics that you that, that you would use to treat COVID-19 patients unless there is a secondary bacterial infection, unless there is an infective complication. Offset the costs of AMS with reduced hospital stay and readmission rates. Support your diagnostic stewardship program. Most of the times we try and give in a cocktail of medicines because we don't know what we're dealing with in a particular case. So diagnostic facilities must be supported, which means that pathology, biochemistry and microbiology departments must really work. They must work. The laboratories must function 24 by seven. People must be available, but for them to work, there has to be material and supplies available. Uh -huh. Stop carbapenem prophylaxis for certain procedures. And finally, be very judicious in your decolonization regimens as an AMS measure. Next slide, please. So these are some of the broad interventions. Try and formally reassess the need and the choice of antibiotics so that you have a time out for antibiotics. Do not interfere at the same time with the treatment of sepsis and septic shock. There you need antibiotics, give it. But then it's very important to have that very fine line, a neat balance between the two of what we ought to do and what we shouldn't desist from doing. Next time, please. Right. Um, th these are also some of the things which are very important. When do we shift from IV to oral? When do we dose adjust? and optimize antibiotics. Do we have automatic alerts with duplications, stop orders? Are we looking at drug-drug interactions when we're giving a cocktail of medicines to one particular patient? And of course, also review clinical information for antibiotic timeouts. Next. Right. Now, this is something that one could adopt as a measure for good AMS practices. Try and have an infection and syndrome specific intervention. Very important to diagnostically evaluate and come to a come to a consensus of one particular diagnosis before uh, and then get, optimize your empiric treatment in the meantime. Reevaluate the need and the choice and prescribe the correct antibiotic for defined infections such as some of these. So it's very important to timely modify based on culture and antibiotic sensitivity results. That is something which, which would go a long way as a guidance for appropriate use of antibiotics. Next slide, please. These are just to show you that quality indicators also do exist in an AMS program. Next, I'm just going to skip this and move fast. 
ओके नेक्स्ट हु इज टू प्ले वॉट रोल इन एम एस दिस इज समथिंग विच इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट द इश्यू नॉर्मली कम्स टू अल्ट एट द डॉक्टर्स डोर स्टेप एवरीबडी फील्स दैट ओनली डॉक्टर्स हैव अ रोल टू प्ले इन एंटी माइक्रोबियल स्टूडेंटशिप द रोल ऑफ द अदर मेंबर्स ऑफ द टीम इज लार्जली अनडिफाइंड एंड इन रीसेंट टाइम्स नेक्स्ट लाइक प्लीज in recent times in 2020 there were two very very good articles that brought out the role of nursing staff in antimicrobial stewardship and there this was one singapore study which concentrated on qualitative analysis understanding what barriers can exist if nurses have to be empowered in an antimicrobial stewardship program and how could their involvement be increased with a lot of focus group discussion and then they found that if you leave nurses to themselves they found that antibiotic administration by these nursing staff is perfectly okay but where was the problem is there was a lack of knowledge a lack of expertise in antibiotic use they didn't know how doctors would perceive if they tried uh, intervening or would they be seen as street smart or unnecessarily smart and even checked out for that would uh, i mean is it okay for them to voice safety concerns sometimes things which are overlooked by the medical staff and can they suggest drug administration guidelines now this this came up in 2020 as one of the very good studies from singapore and there is a need there is an increasing need because just having medical staff looking at ams may not be appropriate may not be good enough we also need to involve our nursing staff next slide please similarly we had yet another study Yeah, from Australia, which almost spoke, and this has come up in January 2021. So I really thought that I would bring this to you. This was a systematic review, and it looked at knowledge, perceptions, and experience of nurses on antibiotic optimization, particularly restricted to the intensive care. Again, the role of a nurse. If the role of the nurse in the ward is not defined, the role of the nurse in the infection uh, in the intensive care unit is definitely going to be lesser defined for AMS programs. and there were almost about 20 years of publications analyzed and what they found is that there is a great potential among nurses in the icu uh, on antibiotic use reducing the time to administration and definitely they could reduce error rates but these were the barriers to their role but again focusing on knowledge deficits interprofessional problems on how they would be seen by doctors and the solutions proposed were enhance their education technology utilization give a very strong nursing leadership so that nobody is going to get cowed down just because a senior physician or a senior surgeon comes and says this is what i will do you all of you just listen to me no it wouldn't be that way because everybody has a role to play in antimicrobial stewardship next slide please right i'll come on to hand hygiene now this is something which we all love talking about hand hygiene is something that has come to the fore since the 1990s and it is there even with us today next so how have we fared with hand hygiene everybody the general consensus of opinion is there have been beautiful pearls with hand hygiene because the covid pandemic one of the uh, prevention measures was wash your hands wash your hands wash your hands and wash your hands all right so hand hygiene has improved in many instances in the pandemic there is an increased compliance among healthcare workers but unfortunately these are some of the problems everybody who is working will follow hand hygiene but there is a general shortage of nursing staff and doctors there has been a layoff of staff in many healthcare institutions and that has been related to bed occupancy the occupancy is only less so therefore why do we need so many staff so this has a lot of problems with a lack of ownership and this has brought us and this brings us to the next uh, point next slide please go on go on next slide yeah so this is a south african study no one slide before this was a south african study it was a quasi experimental study in five phases they uh, took a general audit before they put in these five steps executive governance behavior changes group wide situational analysis electronic data collected with direct observation and analysis then they launched and implemented very good hand hygiene compliance programs and then they made people accountable right from the top to the bottom and then they found that the baseline compliance was actually less than 
But over an eight eight month period post implementation, the compliance jumped by eight to ten percent, which is very good, which is wonderful, which just clearly shows that if you have a multi pronged approach, it does help in improving hand hygiene, starting at the managerial and the administrative level, and definitely that improves HH compliance. It's very important again for managerial administrative support. for healthcare workers to have very good hand hygiene compliance next slide please right implementation now what are the problems i mean when it comes to implementation why is implementation of hand hygiene suffered probably there are time constraints if it's an outsourced agency staff who are going to come and stand outside Uh, or or nurses are procured from another agency it happens in many of our hospitals who's going to keep training because there is a huge attrition of nursing staff there is a huge attrition of even doctors these days there is a huge attrition of the class 3 and the class 4 employees so therefore you have a lot to do with management con uh, commitment continued staff motivation is another challenge who's going to keep motivating them who's going to put pressure on observers the risk of potential punitive action if you don't wash your hands i'll throw you out after three times now these are statements which can sometimes demoralize people rather than encourage them to have very good hand hygiene compliance hostility from fellow colleagues and other staff in hospitals this is something which we face when we go around trying to ask people to wash hands the general thing is hi he has no other work uh, rather than to come and ask us to do hand hygiene all the time next slide please next next slide yeah visitors this is something which which was extremely important just one slide back ma'am yeah i just touch on this visitors this was another study that came up from india and it was so and it was published in the journal of hospital infection which is a uk journal and they had they this talked about challenge in educating and monitoring relatives and visitors it's not enough just looking at our healthcare workers you also look at visitors and relatives of patients who come to see their uh, near and dear ones in the hospital because they seem to have a significant contact with patients and in uh, 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 infection control nurses were put to work observing hand hygiene of visitors over 4 years the percentage was calculated and then they looked at the compliance they found that the compliance was much better among visitors and uh, relatives in medical than surgical wards better in pediatric than in adult units the mother of a newborn was much more amenable to some education and hand hygiene increase it came to 77% look at this figure 77% among the mothers of newborns versus 45% of the rest of the visitors so probably everything started from 20% but then here it jumped to 77% whereas here it just came to a meager 45% so which means the mother of a newborn because they care for their baby so they don't want their babies to get infected so therefore they wash hands very judiciously and this was one of the striking things which this study found and uh, this was uh, published in journal of hospital infection in 2020 next slide Sir, sure. now we, we have about ten minutes more to close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of the last ones that I'm doing. Face masks. I really thought that I must uh, touch on face masks, N95 masks. This is something which we have been using during our COVID-19 pandemic, and one of the common questions which I'm sure it it it, it has plagued even you all is. how do we reuse masks first of all there was a shortage of masks second thing is the n95s were very very expensive so therefore there was a general consensus of opinion that these must be reused but then the company and gen and all the who guidelines and everybody tells you to throw off those masks after one use after an 8 hour shift take it out throw along with the rest of your ppe now how do how does one reprocess this in a very safe manner next slide please so there were some uh, measures which looked at this there were some two or three measures which are fairly good one is if you have a vaporized hydrogen peroxide a sterad gas i mean a sterad low temperature steam uh, sterilizer in the uh, in the uh, hospital 
normally it's the, the concentration of vaporized hydrogen peroxide used is around 35 percent but then if you use it at 59 to 60 percent the filtration efficiency in the fit test when done so it showed very good filtration efficiency very good and it passed the fit test of vaporized hydrogen peroxide as compared to the controls so therefore it's useful in an n95 shortage in the covid pandemic this came up in january 2021 as a study somewhere in 2020 canada came up with a microwave heat based treatment of n95 masks and respirators they also found that the filtration efficiency in fit test probably these are the two main markers that you study in an n95 mask and they showed that the locked in reduction of organisms was very very good Therefore, the, therefore, increasing filtration efficiency, passing the fit test when you use microwaving and heat effect. However, autoclaving did affect the uh, physical characteristics of the N95 mask, and that definite and, and any heat which is more than 90 degrees may not be suitable. This is something which we must remember. The next slide, please. There was a third me method which I would like to touch on: the gravity steam reprocessing. This is a non-toxic gravity stream method. What actually happens here is you expose the masks uh, at 121 degrees for about 30 minutes to steam under pressure. Autoclaving followed by 30 minutes of heat drying. And then you check for physical traits and function tests. It passed the function tests after, 30, after three cycles. But then if you increase the number of cycles, then it does not pass and the physical characteristics also suffer. Probably this is also purported as, as a useful method for reprocessing our N95s when there is a shortage. Again, this came up in 2020. I think that's one of the last slides uh, for this presentation. Yes. So I have tried to touch on some of the most important things because the rest of infection control on VAP and CRBSI and everything is, is something which is understood by one and all. I don't need to sit over here and teach uh, to teach people on ventilator-associated pneumonia. That's not something which you're looking forward to. I've tried to put together some of the recent happenings, the recent trends in various areas of infection control, which uh, probably has a direct impact on our work, on our routine work in hospital infection control probably in the next few months to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ranganathan, for that wonderful lecture. Actually, listening to you talk, right, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, made me realize two things. One is, uh, I wish uh, you were our microbiology teacher, no? the way you pronounce the names of organisms itself is so very nice to hear, right? It makes uh, uh, it very interesting. The second thing is, uh, I wish I was as smart as uh, bacteria or our students are as smart as bacteria. What all they don't do, they share information in groups, they actually reprocess information and then take similar characteristics across. So if such traits were built upon in our students, then there is uh, no uh, comparison, right? We'd go somewhere. So that is uh, jokes apart. Uh, what, there is one question uh, which Dr. Bhatt has asked. Uh, he's our medical director for research. So he wants to know like whether you advise periodic fumigation of OTs and ICUs. No, we do not advise periodic fumigation. Fumigation is something which is completely out. Um, fumigation was out about um, 15 years ago. And then for the next five to seven years, there was some talk about fogging, hydrogen peroxide fogging of theaters, even that is completely out of vogue. Though, of course, many of um, the, the theaters are still fogged with hydrogen peroxide. It doesn't harm anything, but then it doesn't help you. I mean, it just leaves you with a false sense of security that everything is well, all is well. As, as you know, the film Three Idiots taught, uh, taught us, all is well, all is well. I mean, you keep uh, beating your chest and saying all is well. But then finally, it all amounts to cleaning at the end of the day scrubbing, cleaning of surfaces, cleaning of the OT table, cleaning of the surroundings, uh, having a good wash down at the end of the day, that's what makes it uh, ready for use the next day. No amount of fumigation or fogging is going to help. And anyway, formaldehyde is uh, given up because it's supposed to be corrosive, it's supposed to be a co-carcinogen and so on. So I wouldn't recommend fogging at all. 
I mean, fumigation at all. Thank for... you, sir. Hello. Ah, Sorry. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. The other question which uh, uh, which came about, right? Uh, this all started with the uh, times exposure of Nixon sandal scandal, no? People talked about uh, academic or professional freedom, the boundaries versus uh, uh, the restrictions which have been put forth in the name of uh, quality assurance or in the name of stewardship for many of these things. So what is the kind of resistance you face when we actually talk about this antimicrobial stewardship program? Yes, I have faced resistance, particularly when I was at the Breach Candy Hospital. That was a time that was in the 1990s when uh, the concept of antimicrobial stewardship was still at its infancy. It had, it had not hit the Indian shores. It was still an American concept. Uh, we couldn't go. I mean, just imagine going up to somebody like Dr. Farooq Udwadia or, or, you know, uh, big heavyweights, as they are called. Um, um, so say Dr. Tempton Udwadia, you're a surgeon, so you would uh, definitely recognize the name Dr. Tempton Udwadia or they are, so say for instance, Dr. A.S. Madalayar in uh, Madras and ask him and tell him not to use this particular antibiotic. Now, wouldn't they ask you to get out from that place? They would, obviously. <laughs> so, so that, I mean, there is an immediate resistance that one follows. What I have come to realize is Try and sit with each department. Do not call for a full meeting. Try and form a committee. And then the person who jots down, who tries to formulate an antibiotic policy, goes around meeting individual departments, talk one to one, and put forth certain clinical situations and what kind of antibiotics is normally used and could they also use this instead of the previous one. Once they agree upon try and type it out and get a signature from them, give them a copy. And then after that, you could monitor. It's no point go about that. The common mistake which is made in the name of antimicrobial stewardship is just policing around. Now, policing around can can put off anybody. Obviously, the more senior the doctor, the more put off they become. The faster, they, I mean, it's it, 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 the, the, the easier it is to put them off because uh, nobody's going to take very kindly to restricting their antibiotic prescriptions. It has to be a gradual process. A lot of, um, what should I say, interpersonal, inter interprofessional relationships, friendships is something, understanding between people is something that goes a long way in cementing um, uh, antimicrobial stewardship. That's something which helps. I mean, one needs to build relations, drop bridges, and then reach out to people, that is probably when it works. When there is an understanding, they also know that you're not trying to impinge onto their area. We're not trying to tell surgeons how to operate. We're just trying to tell them that in this situation, could you please just use this antibiotic and not that? That's it. Once that is done, I've worked with surgeons over here in Global for almost 20 years. They're not a bad sort at all. They're just a breed apart, that's all. And uh, it's oh, it's, yeah, it's excellent it's, breed apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I never said that you are a horrible breed apart. I only said that you are a breed apart. That's it. It's been very nice working with surgeons. It's just that one shouldn't. Uh, I mean, it's not a good practice to to just keep policing around people. And uh, the worst thing is, you know, when people are unmindful of what actually a patient's diagnosis is. And you go and stop antibiotics and to try to argue on stopping antibiotics or coming down on antibiotics when a patient is dying of sepsis and septic shock. I mean, how can you curtail antibiotics over there? You cannot curtail antibiotic use over there. For whatever it's worth, meropenem and colistin and vancomycin has to be used in that particular scenario. We dare not uh, get into those kind of situations. It's very important to start with the community OPD treatment and then move on to the ICUs. People generally fear to start the other way around. They come down from the ICUs to the OPD, which is not right. That's what I feel. Yeah. So you would say from bottoms up for antibiotic uh, policy one. formation. That Sorry. is good. Uh, we'll ask. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask our dean if he has any questions, comments. Dr. Kotu? Hello? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mahalakshmi. See, certainly as the head of the institution, I have got a couple of uh, thoughts on this occasion. 
one is you know this uh, platform of triple f webinar the block trier is the third microbiologist who has shared the platform the first one to be you know we all know dr uh, none other than uh, dr vishumohan katoj he shared his ideas followed by a professor from games bopal he he had a wonderful session on about something related to infection especially when the covid was at its peak and he narrated in such a wonderful way uh, the many measures many methods indigenously developed how by practicing them they could shield the spread or uh, spread of the this infection in that time which were quite convincing with the data he spoke that is one thought certainly and i also must thank uh, today's speaker dr uh, resource person for uh, giving his thoughts to enrich the whole uh, uh, at- atmosphere over here now i am an anesthesiologist of course i have been the uh, i was even heading the utp committee etc and one thing is as rightly pointed out by the speaker in, in including the hospital infection committee control you know yeah, every hospital even if is is definitely uh, no uh, ot committee is without a, a microbiologist that's right and one more thought is is the right appropriate in the sense our in the avmc management has a uh, like uh, let down the foundation stone for a one wonderful state of art uh, a hospital super specialty hospital in the campus only last week only the the foundation stone over laid very in we have dreamt to have a chair of article with the super specialty departments 130 critical care beds etc and certainly you know the one more thing also our resource person will be happy to know that we have got a very strong dedicated team of uh, microbiologists over here in our uh, institution itself and uh, certainly you know they will not be disappointing uh, your thoughts what you are uh, thinking uh, and uh, one more thing is and i also am an ardent follower of uh, evidence based medicine one million dollar question haunts my mind are we right in applying the evidence generated in a developed country in developing country like india that is really a real question why i am raising this issue is you know as per the statement made by none other than our the former icmr uh, director general dr mrs soumya swaminathan the who is the chief scientist at who now she said that india doesn't have any statistics of the hospital acquired infection at all bold statement given at the who platform when such is the condition we have to think 10 times when we apply be it a guideline be it a protocol be it a, the sop generated elsewhere to apply to our patients and uh, get a good outcome that is one the wisdom lies in us in whether to apply to our group of patient whether to apply to our environment to our circumstances i hope uh, our resource person will uh, uh, concur with that and also he will be happy to know that as a mandate of uh, the regulating council our uh, uh, accredited nabh lab also is functional which then human service during the time of this uh, covid you know so these are some of the thoughts that have come to my mind i think you know i expect that our resource person to share to answer the possible question who are we justified in applying the evidence generated in the developed world in a developing country or under developed country like india yeah yeah now first of all in so sir india is is a developing country <laughs> yes uh, i mean i don't think we could call it an under developed country that's developing, yes yeah developing nation now the second thing is are we justified in bringing the rules of the west to india yes and no is my answer now there are certain areas where we do not even have baseline data now everybody talks about the need for a baseline data but then unfortunately it's never built up it's never built up it doesn't happen at all there has to be a concerted effort probably it's it's no point saying at the national level we would do this because it's too big a country probably so my thought process uh, tells me that it's much better to do it region wise and see what is your basic uh, healthcare associated infection rates in various categories what are the basic problems that we all face and then look at western guidelines now any kind of guideline it's a guideline it doesn't mean it doesn't it's not a dictate that you have to do only that and not something else 
a guideline taken from the West can be taken, but then it needs to be customized to our situation, the way our things function, the way our um, environment functions. Now, there was a talk about do not clean your OT. There's no need to clean your OT. This is something that came from the US once. You don't need to uh, fog at all. But then how many of our hospitals don't fog at all? This is, I mean, we, have, we all still do uh, believe in fogging the theatres. That is because, we are, I mean, our environment is completely different from what exists in the West. So guidelines from the West sh should be taken, should be read, can be taken. But then it's much better if we are able to customize it, modify it, not follow it verbatim, because it's not possible to follow many of those things verbatim over here. We would be making utter fools of, of ourselves. It's better to customize it to our situation and our circumstances, for which we need to have a good in-depth understanding of our own circumstances. So the, the, the bottom line is, first thing is look at our own problems, understand them, and then see how best you could borrow uh, material from the West and try and customize it to arrive at solutions to our problems here. Thank you, Dr. Ranganathan. Sir? Yeah. Uh, thank, okay. thank you, Dr. Yeah. Ranganathan. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Thanks so much. Okay. So, like, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ranganathan for this uh, talk, which was actually started as a very panoramic view. It started as what all has happened in infection control over the last one or two years. And then he moved down into magnified view of certain specific problems. And what I was really impressive about the entire talk, or at least to me, was that you talked about the marriage between the technology, logic, and clear thinking and common sense in infection control practices, and how we can actually translate many of these uh, big, big words into practice, right? How we can put it into uh, what do we call thumbtacks for uh, real uh, use. So that was what I think was the most impressive and take home message from the entire thing. And I, we also really appreciate the way in which you brought in the terrible trio, no? Hypothermia, acidosis, bleeding, that complications in OT and how infection control goes for a six when this happens and hospital acquired infections take a major uh, role in the morbidity of the patients. So this is uh, what is, I think, uh, in summary, the take home message for all of us. And thank you very much for a wonderful session, sir. It has always been a pleasure listening to you. Same here. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. OK. Uh, thank you, sir. So on behalf of this uh, scientific forum of uh, AVMCH and VMRH, we thank our speaker. And before I close, I would like to say a few things to our participants. One is this session is recorded and it went live in the YouTube also. So we would share the link. It is available in our YouTube channel. We'll also share the link with the participants so that you can go back and watch it anytime you want uh, to get clarified on certain points. And the other thing is uh, for the next week, uh, we'll be continuing the same series on emerging and re-emerging infections. And we have another interesting topic next week. That is, we are going to talk about what is new in pediatric pulmonary tuberculosis. And we have none other than Dr. Sushil Kumar Kabra. He is actually a pediatrician and the head of neonatology, you know, pul pediatric pulmonary division of AIMS New Delhi. So he is going to talk to us uh, about uh, what is new in uh, pediatric pulmonary tuberculosis. And Dr. Kabra also happens to be the chief editor of Indian Journal of Pediatrics. So he, I think uh, he will share his rich experiences on that particular topic. So with this, I'll close today's session. I thank everyone for the wonderful session and also for the interests uh, shown by the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ranganathan. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.